and welcome to Eternity. I'm Susan Harris, and I'm so happy you tuned in today. I have an interesting hour planned for you. And today is extra special because I have a guest, another host of an Access 7 television show, Karen Duffy of Talk of the Town, is actually going to be interviewing me on Touch by Eternity, a true story of heaven, healing, and angels. I also have some new faces with regards to music. It is a new season and uh, some new faces and music videos, as a matter of fact, is what I'll be introducing. The, the Doe family from the Estevan Weyburn area has created some music videos and have graciously permitted me to share them with you. So that is another exciting touch. So there won't be a talk today because the interview with Karen Duffy and myself will be taking the place of the talk. And uh, there is actually some new information that you will glean in that interview that I haven't shared on the show before. So that's pretty exciting. There'll be a children's story as usual and prayer for a country. And today's country is Kyrgyzstan. And there'll be prayer for the country and prayer for you at home. My children's segment is called Read with Smokey. And there's his picture, my kitty Smokey. And on today's show, I would be reading a story from a book I have written, Little Copper Pennies. And I will actually be showing you one of the first pennies of 1858. I've also written a book for children, Little Copper Pennies for Kids. So our story will flow in between both of these books. So that's an exciting hour that is coming up for our children right after the interview. Anyway, back to the reason why I created this show eternity. The subject of the afterlife fascinates me as it fascinates millions around the globe. After all, the probability of death is 100%. So we are all curious as to what happens next. Where do we go? But in addition to reading the Bible, I happen to know about eternity because I have been there. And you heard that correctly. You see, I have had what is called near death experiences in which my spirit left my body in moments of intense pain and I found myself in another world. And uh, this phenomenon has actually happened to over 40 million people around the world. But I hadn't known what had happened to me was something that was so common. It wasn't until my third experience in 2017 that a chaplain friend from British Columbia told me that it is called a near-death experience. Now that is a term, near-death experience, is a term coined by one Dr. Raymond Moody of the United States. His patients were coming and telling him about similar experiences like mine, where in moments of intense pain or trauma, or surgery, accidents, they found that their spirits left their bodies and they were in another place. Dr. Moody decided to investigate this phenomenon. And so Dr. Moody gave it the name near-death experience because a lot of people showed the symptoms of death while they were having this experience being in another world. And in my interview with Karen Duffy that's coming up shortly, I will be talking a little bit about some of these angelic encounters and everything else. Dr. Mood was an author as well, so I've bought his books and read up on what he described in his research. Now, being an author myself, I decided to write my story in Touch by Eternity, a true story of heaven, healing, and angels, because I have had six encounters with angels to date, and I have had three near-death experiences, and I've had miraculous healings. I came back from heaven on my first experience in 1998, when I collapsed in my doctor's office. I came back from heaven healed from two medical conditions without the intervention of medicine. And friend, when something like that happens to you, and you begin to realize that this was not a figment of an imagination, then you become driven 
to let people know that there is an eternity to gain and hence the reason for my presence and for this show. And I hope you will tune in each week. Now, if you are skeptical, I can understand that because until it happened to me, I too was a skeptical. Some people may say near-death experience is not written in the Bible. And they would be correct in that the phrase near-death experience is not contained in the Bible, just as several terms we use, selfies, computers, donuts, those aren't listed in the Bible either, but we accept them as real words. Because language is created on an as-need basis, and it describes what did not exist before. However, the Even phenomenon of near-death experience does exist. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul talks about a man who was taken up into the third heaven and he came back, but he was not allowed to tell what he saw. A lot of us come back and we do not speak about it. The Bible has other occurrences of people who were raised from the dead but we never hear their testimonies of what they saw or experienced. Uh, my first experience occurred in 1998, and it wasn't until 2017, 19 years after that I began to go public with my story and decided I was going to write this because what I experienced seemed so way out there, I didn't think that anybody else had experienced this and how wrong I was. Because as I began to share on social media, as I began to write and launch my books and speak with people and do research, people started to feel safe with me. Not just people internationally reached out to me on social media and email, but people right here in Saskatchewan, in Yorkton, Regina, wherever I go to speak in Manitoba, I have had so many people tell me that they have had significant experiences, a near death, an encounter with an angel, some other divine intervention, which they have chosen to not share with others because they are afraid of being ridiculed. And so here I came on the scene with my story and just as I am real looking at you and speaking today, my experiences were real to me and it propelled me to talk about this. And in so doing, it gave a number of people a safe zone to have these conversations. And if you have a story, I would love to hear about it. You can connect with me via my email, susan at susanharris.ca or on my website, susanharris.ca and... Let me know any feedback you may have, any story or encounters that you would wish to share. And while you are there, I would love if you would sign up for my newsletter. On the right hand side of the website, and there's a screenshot, you can just enter your name and your email address. And I guarantee you that your email address will be safe with me. <music>I heard this and wanted to share it with you. So these two lawyers decided to go deer hunting. So the first lawyer looked at some tracks that he saw and he said, okay, I think these are deer tracks, so we should follow them. The second lawyer said, I think they are elk tracks and it is not elk season, so we should not be following those. It will just be a waste of time. Each lawyer held on to his own view and they were still arguing and that's when the train hit them. And right now, I would like to introduce the Doe family through music video. The Doe's are a fourth generation family group with tight, harmonious and full live band accompaniment with varying styles of gospel music. In this video, Lauren Doe will be singing a song she has written and it is entitled Cold Winds. Here is the Doe family band. Blowing. You're not sure 
it just when you came But it's howling now, it's ripping at your shingles and leaving you bills to pay Don't open up your windows, the place will shift and sway Just close the door, get down on your knees and the wind will blow away You listen to what they say Those cold winds of doctrine Well, they ain't a fresh breeze of change Tearing off the leaves from all of the trees And messing up the way don't think you can take my joy no. Rolling over with your clouds of gray no way. It's right there in the word It is black, it is white And the truth will never change Cold winds Cold winds Cold winds from all over Don't you listen to what they say Cold winds Listen to what we say No, I will not be blown about The rock cannot be moved And I'll still be standing when the poem's over And the sun comes shining through Don't you listen to what they say Cold winds are dark cold winds Cold winds from all over Don't you listen to what they say They're Cold winds from all over Don't you listen Wasn't that simply and truly a delight? If you would like to find out more about the Doe family and their music, or how you can purchase their CDs or book them for a concert, please visit their website at thedoefamily.com. And do note that the word Doe is spelled D-A-A-E. And the song that Lauren sang, Cold Winds, is found on the CD called The Joy of the Lord. As I said earlier, there won't be a talk today. In its place, there will be that interview with Karen Duffy and myself. Karen Duffy is the host of Access 7 Talk of the Town, and I was so happy that she was able to be a part of Eternity and I a part of her show. Today on Talk of the Town, I'm very pleased to introduce Susan Harris, who is here as the author of Touched by Eternity. This is actually a true story of your heaven healing an angel. It is, Karen, and thank you very much for having me as a guest on Talk of mm -hmm. the Town today. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak about my book. I'm very actually pleased to be able to bring this book to people's attention because I find that, you know, inviting Jesus into your heart sometimes... Um, things have to happen in our lives for us to recognize that that is maybe something we need. Absolutely. Uh, for me, it started off when I was a kid. My parents took me to church, so I was able to develop my own faith. But I have found, indeed, that for a number of people, uh, adversity in life may draw them to Christ. And, right. And, uh, you know, the point about inviting Jesus into a heart ties into the very essence of the book and the essence of eternity because mm -hmm. we only have eternal life through inviting Jesus into our hearts. 
because that's how eternal life is obtained. Right. Why would you think that some people might be um, afraid to invite Jesus into their hearts? I think people might probably be afraid because they have been taught differently. Some people may be skeptic, some people may consider themselves atheist. And so different worldviews determine how people view what is written in scripture. And I respect the beliefs of different groups. Right. What my book has shown me is that what I believed in and what I have actually seen and what the Bible says to be true of Jesus and of healing and of the life to come did in fact line up with what was said in scripture. And so that reinforces my own belief in the Bible mm -hmm. and Jesus. Very nice. Your husband was with you or he came home because you contacted him at the beginning of your book. You wanted him to come home because you weren't feeling well. Tell me a little bit about that experience. This was a Saturday, June 24th, 2017. And I had dental surgery. And in the aftermath of it, three days after, the pain was not going away. In fact, it was getting worse. Mm -hmm. And so I had taken some medication and thought I would go back to bed. But what indeed happened is that I found I could not really move. I could not go to bed, my phone dropped out of my hands, my teeth started to chatter, mm -hmm. and I wanted to check out uh, how does chattering teeth right. lead to yes. dental surgery. Mm -hmm. And that's when my phone dropped out of my hand, they were lifeless, and I knew that something imminent was, was happening. Really happening. Something was radically wrong. And so I one finger typed, you know, I have my phone. I have the touch ID. Right. And yes. so it opened up and I one finger to type, come home and he came home. And your your husband actually works at the hospital? Yes, my yes. husband works with the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Uh, he's also a farmer. Mm -hmm. So he was farming on that day, that's his hobby. And uh, mm -hmm. he was moving hay bales from one uh, field to the other. Right. Where could this book be purchased? This book uh, is currently available in town here at Coles. Okay. I had a book signing there on nice. May the 11th, and it was quite successful. The book is also available on Amazon worldwide. And of course, through my website, susanharris.ca. You also have your own show on Access. I do. I host Eternity, and it was birthed from this book and from my uh, near-death experiences. I've had three, as you know. I have had miraculous healings as well, all which are written in this book. I have had encountered with angels, and carried by angels, I do not mean lovely human beings that do something nice for us, and right. we, we give them the affectionate term of angel. No, I refer to the divine beings, the messengers that God sends to protect us at a particular point in time. And I have had two of those on this earth, one in Las Vegas when my husband and I were on our honeymoon in 2011. That's the most notable angel experience here. The supernatural, when being uh, taken off to eternity. There has been accompaniment by angels as well. When being taken down to view hell, there was an angel that escorted me as well. But those are in the afterlife. But I've had angels experience in this mm -hmm. life here as well. How would one recognize that they're having an angel experience? Uh, would, would you be able to recognize the difference between, you know, someone who does a nice thing for you opposed to the real? Oh, absolutely. For one thing, a divine angel, a messenger from God does not have human parents or human relatives. Hmm. So anyone who is born of a woman, they're not an angel. So if those people come up to you to do something good, they're just being kind. kind. But uh, the one we saw, particularly in Las Vegas, we were in danger. My husband and I wanted to see how iconic the iconic strip really is. <laughs> and it's pretty iconic, eh? <laughs> it is. We wanted to have a night out on the strip. Mm -hmm. I don't drink, I don't party, I don't do anything that's associated with the culture of Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. But there's 
a lot you could enjoy in Las Vegas. So we were staying at the beautiful smoke-free Trump Hotel, and we decided we would go out in the night and just see what everybody does. And when we were coming back, that's when we encountered danger. Someone was approaching us. We believed that this person did not have good intentions. And as they were crossing the road, like the person wolf whistled, and there were whistles coming back. And at that point, he started to walk towards us, and we sort of felt, is this a gang-related mm -hmm. event? We were, we were scared. And uh, he's crossing the road, and just as he reaches that middle line, I look up and I see this person, this big person. And at the same time, I saw that person, Karen, the youth who was coming across to us. He was swearing, and he was mm -hmm. just belligerent. Mm -hmm. We had done him nothing. Right. And he stopped. He stopped as if he had bumped into an invisible wall. At the moment I saw that figure ahead, mm -hmm. and it coincided together. And I have goosebumps. <laughs> you know, and, and that's one of the things that happens when I tell the stories of the miraculous and the divine and the supernatural. Mm -hmm. Because that response in your body through goosebumps is something that I cannot manufacture. That's right. It's, it's more that what I'm saying is resonating. Absolutely. With. And uh, that confirmation going through yes. my being. Yes. <laughs> and the book is filled with a number of experiences, a lot of them, because I saw things in eternity that mm -hmm. I line up with what. I actually saw again on Earth and I've put it together. And I think one of the things that this book has that is different from some other books written is that I do have the theological background through which to interpret my experiences. Mm -hmm. I have been speaking to churches and church groups for three decades now. And I have training in biblical theology as well as training as a teacher, training, postgraduate training. So the ability to research and the ability to form uh, interrelationships and to draw uh, conclusions, to right. postulate an idea and an insight for discussion. And one of the reviewers actually said on the Chapters Indigo website that the aim of my book, as I wrote it, is to provoke thinking and to encourage uh, both believers and non-believers. And she said for her, those objectives were accomplished. And that makes me feel really good because there is a number of things to challenge thinking, to provoke thinking, to point a person in a direction of thought that he or she may not have considered before. Right. And only because he or she did not have these experiences. Right. But I have found that uh, God gives these experiences. He lifts the veil and allow any of us to speak into the afterlife. So what happened to me could easily happen to someone who's viewing us. It could happen to you. It could happen Absolutely. to a stranger. That's right. Have you had anybody who's come to you as a non-believer and in talking with you or reading your book, have they kind of turned around that you know of? I have had several people who have told me that just holding the book brought joy. And this was really different. Just holding the book yes, brings joy. Yes, there was one lady nice. who purchased the book. And she came back and she told uh, someone close to me that she purchased the book. She didn't open it or anything. She just held it. And she was having a rough day. And she said, as the cliche goes, the sorrow turned into joy. And that person came back and told me this. <laughs> and I was actually with someone two Saturdays ago. And she was, uh, I wouldn't say it's a small place. So, you know, I, I'll just keep yeah. the details away. But she basically said that the tears that were streaming down her face were happy tears. Because I came to her and within five or six minutes, she said something changed. And she's just started to feel peaceful and she just started to feel uplifted. And I was in Humboldt last week and I spoke at a church there 
and I was uh, speaking to someone after, and they had a death as well, you know, there's a lot of death in Humboldt and the Lord led me to go there to cry with the people and to bring the peace of, and healing of heaven that I had received on October 16, 1998, because I came back with two miraculous healings of which I have medical proof, right. and it's all written in this book, and um, I was filled with peace. Right. And I talked to her about a scripture, and something happened, and I was describing it to my husband, like a light came on her face. Mm -hmm. uh, she said to me after, God sent you to Humboldt for me. Um, you know, when... Shivers again. <laughs> you know, when uh, our producer is in the studio, mm -hmm. at first it's dark. And then when he turns on the light, I can see how your face glows, or you can see mine, I yes. can see his. Yes. And it was like that when, with that particular woman. Mm -hmm. And another gentleman on Saturday while I was book signing, I saw the same thing on him. It was as if someone had turned on the camera lights and so that glow mm -hmm. came on. Right. I've seen that in three people now. Not in everyone. Right. And those people have confirmed to me that it was very, very reassuring to them when I spoke and they felt something was mm -hmm. different. And so I have been very vulnerable in writing this book. I felt if I didn't write it, I would have a fourth near death experience. Right. I didn't want to suffer pain anymore. Right. I felt the Lord had been investing in me all of these years since I was a child and through biblical education and through church growth and through spreading the gospel and through writing and through the jobs I held and the education I pursued and the other books that I wrote and gave, got recognition as a nonfiction writer. Uh, I felt it was all channeling me to write Touched by Eternity. And it's not easy to describe your use of a bedpan. Right. Yes. In a hospital. It's not easy. And no. Good job for you. Things. Good job for you, though. You've done it uh, so, very tactfully. Um, <laughs> you know, to allow people to come into your private life, what would have been easy mm -hmm. would have been for me to exit this world when I had any of those near-death experiences. That's right. Easy God, would have been, right? God kept me here for a purpose, and so I recognize I had to share, and that purpose is to lead people to Christ. Absolutely. I felt I had three mandates. Each time I came back from heaven, I had a new mandate. On October 16, 1998, when I collapsed in my doctor's office, he was there, I was here, and he said, you were dehydrated. I had hyperemesis gravidarum, mm -hmm. morning sickness all around the clock, and he's arranging home care for me. And I just collapsed on the <laughs> desk. And immediately I was walking on green grass in this most beautiful place that I describe as heaven. And a large person was walking beside me. And I was in the shadow. And as a Christian, the Bible is alive and real to me. And that scripture in Psalm 91, 1, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I knew where I was. And that day when peace filled me so much, I came back healed. I never threw up a single day after that in my mm. pregnancy. And I started to put on weight. And I came back with a second healing that I have medical proof of as well. Mm -hmm. And so I felt the Lord was saying that that peace that filled you and that supernatural healing that when you go in the power of the Holy Spirit, not me, I don't have any power of my own. Mm -hmm. I am just like anybody else. But because of what has happened to me, I believe that the Lord will revive that when I go selflessly to present his word. Yes. And that men and women, boys and girls will receive peace and healing. And those people who have told us that just the very presence of the book in their lives or me being in their company produce a change, I said to my husband, I should probably begin tracking these things <laughs> because it was so unexpected that 
I didn't have a spreadsheet. I, you know, I <laughs> yes. usually when it, when you set out objectives, you always have to measure it. <laughs> You know, according to lean, I did lean in the health right. region too. <laughs> and as teachers, you have your lesson plan and you always have to be measuring your objectives. Well, I didn't create any measurements for this book in terms of right. how people would react and respond. That's right. My end point was that they would know the Lord, that they would come into eternity, that that light I saw on June 24, 2017, as I lay dying. And what was interesting on that day, Karen, is that we saw the physical and the spiritual aspects of dying. See, when my husband came home and he was looking at me, he was observing what was happening in the physical. Right. And I was seeing things in the life to come. And after we came back from the hospital, because 911 was called on the train, right and the doctor interrogated me, I realized I had told the doctor what I was seeing in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. So of course, you know, it may have been a bit confusing for him, but now when uh, we came home, we started to put our stories together. And you know, I said to my husband, uh, when my body was doubled up, I felt as if water was gushing out from my tummy. And he was like, but well, your body wasn't doubled up. You weren't in no fetal stand. So right. you were lying straight on your back. Hmm. But Karen, in the spiritual, the way my life was coming That's out right. was in the form of water gushing out, and I was in this fetal position. Like a fetal rebirth. Something. Something. Yes. Unexplainable. But in, in water. And you know, the Bible talks about the um, water of life, and yeah. that from our bellies shall flow rivers of living water. And that took on a different meaning right. for me on that day. And so he also saw. See, I saw a castle. I saw the most beautiful blue castle that I described in chapter three. Right. It's called um, a castle, a face, and a light. Yes, I was just going to say that. A face, a castle, and a light. Right. And that is what you saw. And uh, when I saw that castle, it was the most, it was the most amazing sight I had seen. It was so exquisite exquisitely beautiful mm -hmm. and I took off my glasses because I was watching this castle but when I told my husband that in the evening I said I saw this most beautiful thing he said I knew when you saw it because your eyes popped like that's when mm -hmm. I took off my glasses so I could pop my eyes because he was on the phone with the health line at he that was, point yeah, and he was right. watching me mm -hmm. and I thought my eyes were closed because I was seeing the other line right. And he said, your eyes had indeed been closed. And then you know, all of a sudden, your face lost this expression of pain. Mm, like you saw the most beautiful and, place on earth. Yeah, and he said, your eyes just widened and popped, and you were looking beyond my shoulders at something in amazement. Had I not have a witness there for this, mm -hmm. we would not have been able to know how to interplay what right. he saw and what I was doing. And mm -hmm. so in my press release, it was stated that our experiences are like a two-sided coin. And we have an indisputable uh, theory on how the human body exits this life. Mm -hmm. And that is something no one can deny or take from us because it's my experience. It's right. my experience. That's right. It's not something we could make up. And God gives each person their own experience that they process through their filters and through their own context. Right. In chapter 4, you speak of a glimpse of heaven. And in Revelation, the Bible states that there's no pain in heaven. And in your glimpse, your pain was gone. Yes, that's when I saw the castle. Okay. And I had only glimpsed it. So you were there, and while you were glimpsing it, your pain was gone. My pain was gone. But see, I also had seen the light. And okay. I tried to capture the light on here <laughs> because I saw the most brilliant light coming towards me. And the scripture was echoed in my mind. I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you will no longer have to walk in darkness, but I will lead you unto the everlasting life. Mm -hmm. 
And I knew that that was Jesus coming to usher me into eternity. Jesus was coming to meet me. And uh, the light was orange. And as it came closer, it took on the form of this gold, a, a beautiful, deep gold. And then the gold gave way to an umbra style, to mm -hmm. champagne color. And then it continued becoming clearer and clearer until it was just a beautiful white light. Now, the thing is, we have spotlights all around Right? Here. Yes, we do. <laughs> we can't watch these. No. No, we can't watch these. We can't watch the sun. That's right. Um, I wear glasses. I wear contact lens in my left eye. But on that day, June 24th, 2017, I looked at that light. And there was no sense of dazzle or pain. Mm -hmm. And that's and no fear. another thing. Or no, oh, no fear at all. No fear. And uh, that's how it is with Jesus and with love. And that's why I believe in Jesus. And that's why I would encourage people to believe in Jesus. Because even before I had seen these things, I had always believed. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says, blessed are they who have not seen and still have believed. So there is a greater blessing inherent for every person mm -hmm. who believes the word of God. Right. Um, what would you say to someone who um, had someone who was in their last stages of life or someone who was close to their end of life and they were afraid? You know, one of the things I wanted to do, and I've stated it in a blog I wrote throughout the book, is that I want to remove the fear of dying right. from people. People mm. are afraid of death because they do not know what to expect on the That's other right. side. But I have the seen, unknown, right? yes. I even if I hadn't gone to heaven and had near death experiences, I was never afraid of death okay. because I had always believed what the Bible say about this beautiful life to come. Right. But I had always thought all we would be doing is singing all day and night. I had never really <laughs> given a thought to what we do. going to have fun all day. <laughs> it, it is. It's tr it truly is very, very scenic. And there are lots of things that will be done in heaven. And people will be walking about. And people will be doing a number of things, which is just for another mm -hmm. show. Right. But I would say to the people, you see the scripture says, perfect love drives out all fear. And Jesus is that perfect love. The scripture right. says, Jesus speaking says, I am calm that you would have life and you would have life more abundantly. Because you see, God so loved the world that he gave his son, Jesus. And he has that wonderful plan that we would be living with God in eternity. But sin separates us from God. That sin that occurred in the Garden of Eden, that sin separates us from God. And we were all later born into sin uh, because of that uh, innate nature. But Jesus Christ came and died on the cross. He was the sacrifice for our sins. But the thing that separates Christianity from every other religion, from every other belief, is the fact that our leader just didn't die, but on the third day he rose again. And so if uh, anyone would invite Jesus into their hearts to forgive their sin, he will come in and he will forgive your sins and you will have eternal life. And... Uh, I on page 60. That's right. Important. On page 60, we're going to give you a little bit of an ending right now. And again, we will do another show. For sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. I officially invited Jesus in my heart at age 13. And this is the prayer I said. Dear Jesus, I have sinned and I need your forgiveness. I invite you to be my Savior and Lord. Help me to be the kind of person you want me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross and giving me eternal life. Amen. And friend, if you would say that prayer today, Karen, if you would say that prayer today, uh, Jesus will come into your life and remove the fear of dying. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, be sure to check out her book as well as her show on Sundays at 930. This is Talk of the Town and I'm Karen Duffy. <music> It is now time for our Read with Smokey segment. Hello again, boys and girls. 
Smokey is very happy that you joined us here today and I hope you will enjoy this story I'm about to read. It's one that I have written, Little Copper Pennies. Now this book is the adult version of the penny books as they are referred to. And here we have the children's version, Little Copper Pennies for Kids. And I wrote these books, boys and girls, when the penny retired from circulation back in 2013. This here is one of the first pennies that was minted in 1858. I'm not sure if you can see it very well. This penny looks a bit dark because it's got some dirt on it, some copper oxide and different things. So I will put up a snapshot there on the screen so you can see what a penny looked like. It was actually the size of a quarter and there's a lot of facts and stories and fun things to do in this book little copper pennies for kids it is all too much for this segment here so I am just going to just show you it briefly and I will be coming back to this book on another day right now I would like to read you the story and this is a true story based on what my daughter did when she was a kid. Ruth had received a giant baby bottle as a gift when she was born, which she talked about many times. The oversized container resembled a baby's feeding bottle. For many years, Ruthie, as she was called, piled pennies into the bottle. It seemed to take an eternity, but finally it was full. With her mother's help, Ruthie's six-year-old fingers had placed penny after penny into paper rolls. Painstakingly, she filled and rolled and filled and rolled again. Three times they had trekked to the store for more wrappers, only to find that they were out of stock on the last trip. I can put them in plastic bags. Ruthie rushed in the direction of the kitchen eagerly, her long dark curls swinging up and down. The bank will not take plastic bags, sweetie, her mom explained to the child. I'll get some rolls when I go to the city. Soon the day came when they stood before the teller in the bank. How can I help you? The teller asked Ruthie's mom. It's her that needs help. The mother gestured to Ruthie on the left, who was barely discernible behind the counter. They were both holding the heavy bags of metal currency. The teller leaned forward to see the child and commented on how cute she was with her crisp dark curls and large luminous eyes. So I'm actually going to leave out some parts and read it because we don't have a lot of time in the segment here today. What can I do for you? The woman asked Ruthie in a soft voice. The girl started back. I want to change my pennies. Ruthie and her mom heaved the bags onto the counter. Counting the dollars aloud, the teller handed the paper money to the child. Eighteen dollars for you, she chimed. What are you going to do with all that money? Eighteen dollars? Ruthie repeated the words as a question and her already large eyes grew larger. She did not fully understand the value of eighteen dollars, but it sounded like a lot of money. Her brown eyes sparkled and she touched the dollars with tenderness akin to reverence. This was her money. I will buy Easter eggs for the seniors home. Even, Even as Ruthie replied, she held tightly onto the bill as if afraid they could get lost. The child's little kindness had delighted the seniors, and many of them had patted her cheeks and hugged her. Dressed in blue tulle and chiffon, she floated like a fairy princess, offering a basket of eggs to residents and seniors at the home. I'll just stop there right now, boys and girls. So Ruthie did in fact change her money at the bank and she used the money to buy Easter eggs which she took to the seniors home and that story was one that I put in the book when I was writing it in 2012. So here are some pictures actually. People used to put pennies in a birthday cake. People used to get a penny from the tooth fairy and there was a lot of things that the penny used to do boys and girls. So I will be reading more about the penny another time. There is lots to do. I will probably do penny magic with you and do a few of the games that I have in the book here. And I will continue to read more from the adult book for you and from the children's book 
and I will actually bring some more pennies to show you as well. Thank you for joining in today. Smokey is very happy that you joined in. I will see you next week where I will read you another story on Read with Smokey. Have a good week. We will now go into our Prayer for Countries segment and our country today is Kyrgyzstan and it is located just where the arrow is pointing to. Kyrgyzstan is a country in Central Asia and it is located on the map right here where the arrow is pointing to, this orange mass of land. It borders China, it's actually to the west of China. And here we see Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan as border countries. The conventional long form is Kyrgyz Republic and the conventional short form is Kyrgyzstan. The capital of Kazakhstan is Bishek and that is located just here. The total area of Kazakhstan comprises 189,500 square kilometers. Most of Kazakhstan was formally annexed to Russia in 1876. Kazakhstan became a Soviet Republic in 1936 and achieved independence in 1991 when the USSR was dissolved. Their date of independence is August 31st, 1991. The population of Kazakhstan is 6.2 million people and this source is from the World Bank and it's a 2017 figure. The Kazakh is spoken by 65% of the population and Russian by 12% and these are the two official languages. Kazakhstan is described as a poor mountainous country with a predominantly agricultural economy. Some of the agricultural products grown are tobacco, cotton, potatoes, vegetables, fruits and berries. There's also sheep raising as well as goat and cattle and wool is quite an industry there. Kazakhstan has the world's largest natural growth walnut forest, I discovered in the research. Some of its natural resources include hydropower, deposits of gold and rare metals, coal, oil and natural gas, and several other mineral deposits. Its industries include small machinery, textile, food processing, gold, to name a few. There are more, of course. I'm going to play some music and treat the following information as prayer points. In terms of religions, Muslim comprise the vast majority at 75%, Russian Orthodox at 20%, and other religions form 5%. And I am quoting from, from the CIA World Factbook. During Soviet times, the state atheism was encouraged. Today Today, however, Kazakhstan is a secular state, though Islam has exerted growing influence in politics. Kyrgyzstan, the facts say, is an overwhelmingly Sunni Muslim nation. The other faiths practiced in Kazakhstan include Russian Orthodox and Ukrainian Orthodox versions of Christianity. A small minority of Germans are Protestant Christians, mostly Lutherans and Baptists. A few animistic traditions survive, as do influence from Buddhism, such as the tying of prayer flags to sacred trees, though some view this practice as rooted within Sufi Islam. And I truly pray that the Lord will move to our precious brothers and sisters. The CIA World Factbook also lists uh, several current issues, such as the privatization of state-owned enterprises. There's also negative trends in democracy and political freedoms and we pray for the positive move of the freedom of the people and that the power of Jesus Christ will move in every possible way. I pray for the reduction of corruption and for improved inter-ethnic relations. I pray that terrorism will be combated and the Lord will show his love for the people of Kyrgyzstan. 
The fact book also names some environmental issues. And so I pray against the ills of water pollution. Many people get their water directly from contaminated streams and wells, and as a result, waterborne diseases are prevalent. And so I pray that the people would be able to access clean drinking water and that their immunities will be strengthened. I also pray for the increasing soil salinity from faulty irrigation practices, that proper methods would be considered and the soil would revert back to being good. The CIA World Factbook states that the tradition of bride kidnapping is illegal, but it is still practice. And so I pray that the girls and young women will be safe and free from the fear of kidnapping as Lord Jesus. The CIA Factbook ends its information with a section called Transnational Issues. And in terms of international disputes, it is noted that there are border issues with Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. There are also illicit drug issues. There's the illegal cultivation of cannabis and opium poppies. Will you keep Kyrgyzstan in prayer, friend, as they fight corruption, as they restructure the domestic industry and attempt to attract foreign investment so that their country can grow? Thank you so very much. The people of Kyrgyzstan are precious to the Lord and he died for their souls. I'd like to pray now for those of you who are watching this program, men, women, boys and girls. I pray that the peace of God is going to fill your soul right now. You are so valuable that Jesus gave his life for you. That's the highest price, the highest show of love, the highest show of grace and mercy that anyone can do, that they would lay down their lives for their friends. The scripture tells us that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. Because nothing will separate you from the love of God, the scripture tells us. Not poverty, not tribulations, not sorrows, not things to come. Because if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you are saved and washed in his blood, then you have the power of the resurrected Christ working in you. And there are days when you may not feel very powerful. And it's okay because this is a life of faith. This is not a life of feeling friend this is not just what we feel this is what we know and we stand on the word of God that says that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world the Lord God has triumphed over Satan and his enemies I pray today that the optics in front of you will not determine your faith but there is something greater there is a bigger promise there is a blessing that is coming to you even though you cannot see it right now you you are not measured by people's opinion of you. You are created in the image of the Most High God and he stamps you as his own. He bless you as his own. He loves you as his own and he is coming back for you because you are precious and dear to him. I pray that you will not define yourself by what you see. You will not define yourself by your past because your past is forgiven if you have come to the cross. What is important here, friend, is your future and where you are going and what the Lord says of you. And he say you were born of God and the evil one isn't going to touch you. The scripture says that you belong to God and he holds you in the palm of his hands. The scripture say that he is your refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He says that, yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow, the darkness, the shadows, the deep down valley where it appears to be lonely, it is never lonely because the Lord our God is with you. He walks with you. And I know that the Lord reigns and God reigns in your life today. I pray that the purpose of God will be manifested in your life, that the enemy's stronghold will be broken in the name of Jesus. For the scripture says that all power has been given unto us, that in the name of Jesus, Jesus, we shall speak to the demons and they shall flee. And I speak to any demon that is encamped around you and yours. And I say in the name of Jesus, on the authority of the word of 
God to go back into outer darkness where you belong. And friend, you pray the word of God. You pray the same word that I have. We're serving the same God. What he says in your Bible is what he says in my Bible. Believe it and act as if you believe it. I am praying for you in the conquering name of Jesus that you will sleep, that you will get rest, that you will be able to digest your meals. You will speak words of life to those around you, that your faith will rise. You did not tune into this program here by chance today. Jesus is in your house. Jesus has come your way. There is no distance in prayer. And over the airwaves, you can be healed right now. Over the airways, you can experience the peace of God in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm praying for you this week, friend. Tune in next Sunday where we will pray again. God bless you. As in every show, I want to give you the opportunity to invite Jesus into your life if you haven't done so before. You see, God loves us and has a wonderful plan for our life. But sin separates us from knowing that wonderful plan he has for our lives. So God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose on the third day again. And anyone who will accept Jesus' forgiveness of sin on the cross and invite him into their lives will spend an eternity with God the Father in heaven. If you would pray with me, Jesus will forgive your sins and you will live with Father God in eternity. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I have sinned and I need your forgiveness. I invite you to be my Savior and Lord. Help me to be the kind of person you want me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and for giving me eternal life. Amen. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Eternity Friends. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Susan Harris, inviting you to join me next week as we ponder life's most vital question, where will you spend eternity?